So hi everyone, in this video I'm going to show you some of the best inbuilt add-ons that come with Blender. So these are free add-ons you can optionally enable in the user preferences. There's actually a surprising amount of functionality that's hidden away in these add-ons that I think would be really useful for people. And just to clarify before we begin, what I'm talking about is if you go into the edit and then preferences, then in the add-on section you'll find a long list of add-ons. It will have all the ones that you've installed yourself, it will have the official add-ons and also community-made add-ons that have been pre-packaged with Blender that you can enable when you need them. But before we get into it, this video is sponsored by NVIDIA and PC specialist, but we'll talk more about them later. So one question is, if the functionality in these optional add-ons is so good, then why isn't it enabled by default? And well, the answer for that is quite simple, because the more add-ons you have enabled, the longer Blender takes to load up, because every time it starts, it has to register all the classes from all the different add-ons. So realistically, you should only really enable add-ons that you know you're going to use, because otherwise you're just going to be slowing down Blender unnecessarily. So I'm going to put on my glasses and we're going to get into the first add-on, which is Loop Tools. And one of the things that makes it really useful is that it gives you a collection of operations you can use to modify loops in edit mode. So if you enable Loop Tools and then you go into edit mode, say I have a cylinder here, I'll select both faces, so the front and back face, then I'll inset them by pressing I, and then if I've got that face there, I can right click, go to the loop tool section and press bridge, and it's going to bridge those two faces together and automatically put the faces in between. Okay, so another thing you can do is flatten. So if you take this plane here with these vertices pulled up, go into edit mode, right click, loop tools and flatten. Now it's going to roughly keep their positions, but it's going to average it out on one axis. And you can actually control specifically which axes are influenced in the properties down here. You can also change the fit mode and the influence as well. So if you don't want to flatten it entirely, then you can change that. So again, that's just handy if you wanted to quickly flatten the surface. Okay, but a lot of people already know about loop tools, but I'm going to show you one little trick that is a bit of a dirty trick that I quite like for getting kind of holes in objects. So I'm going to show you this now. I have a cubic shape here, and if we go into face mode, you can see we've got a collection of different edge loops going around the object. I have a face here at the front and one at the back. And one of the cheap ways to make a perfect circle for an object, perfect in quotes, is we're going to take these faces, the front and back, inset them, then we're going to right click and subdivide a couple of times. Now you can think about the number of times we subdivide this little square here is going to represent the number of segments that are around the circle. Then once we've got that face subdivided a couple of times, we're going to right click, loop tools, and then press circle. So that's going to make a circle out of our subdivided faces. Then instead of cutting through immediately, we're going to inset again, so we get an extra loop, and then we can right click and then bridge them. So I'm going to reduce that strength down to zero, and I'm going to bring the segments down to one as well. So we've got our perfect circle going through. Now if we go into edit mode, and then we can apply a subsurf modifier, I just press control and free. We can see that it works pretty well for a subdivision surface object, but it's still not that great around the edges here. It's inconsistent sharpness because we're not exactly using quads all the way around. As you can see here, this is an end gone. But one thing we can do is we can add another edge loop here, just to help tighten that up. And by the way, you can add an edge loop by pressing Control R, just in case you didn't know, and then hovering over the edge, you want to add the loop. So by adding another loop here, we can tighten up that sharpening and make it a lot more consistent. One thing to keep in mind though, is that if you do shade smooth, you might get some issues around the edge. So it is a bit of a dirty method, but it's a quick way of getting a circle cut through without necessarily using all the quad topology. So we'll do another one very quickly. So inset, subdivide, subdivide, circle, inset, bridge and we've got another one there so good to go okay so another add-on i like that comes in blender is called tri lighting the reason i like this one is because sometimes it's really annoying you know what kind of lighting you want to have around an object you want to fill light a key light maybe a rim light but you think oh god i have to make every light individually and then i have to point them towards the object then i have to balance the values and stuff like that tri lighting is interesting because once you've enabled it if you press shift a go down to light you'll find a new option called free point lights now it's grayed out by default. Now why is that? It's because we don't have an object selected. So the interesting thing this does is if you choose an object, so we've got our subject here, I suppose it can be an empty if you want as well. Go back to shift A, light, three point lights, it's going to automatically give us three lights. Now the interesting thing about this is that they're constrained to the object that we had selected. So if I press G to move these, we can rotate them around the object and they're automatically going to point towards the object. Now that makes it really cool and easy to start building your own lighting setup. Now these values are quite low by default, so I'm going to kind of make these bigger and then increase the power. Let's do 300, maybe 300 for that one as well. 150. Okay, so we can go into our rendered mode. By the way, I do have a principled volume shader attached here, density 0.02 with a kind of mid gray value. So we've got some lighting going here. Like I said, while we're in this rendered view, I can press G, move it down, and we know that it's going to keep pointing towards the object. So that's very easy. While we're in the rendered view, we can just modify it however we like. So let me add a color here, maybe something red. What about something a bit yellowy there? Maybe even blue and bring that around. 
So I like this tri lighting add on because it's a quick way you can set up this three point lighting without necessarily having to add all the lights individually and point them all towards the object. But one other tip I just want to throw in is that if you are setting up your lights manually, one thing you can do, say if I take a area light here, is you see this little yellow dot here underneath the light. If you click and drag that and point it towards the object, it will automatically snap the direction of the light to that point that you're hovering over. So that's a quick way to make something point towards an object. Just grab the little yellow dot and move it over to the object. For each of these lights, you can also modify the constraints if you click on them, then go down to the constraint properties. Then in here, you'll be able to see that it's got the track to object. So you can change the object there, any of the other parameters and even add more constraints. Okay, the third one is another add-on that I think should actually just be in Blender anyway, the modifier tools add-on. What this does is add some quiet essential buttons, I would think. Right here, see I've got an object selected. We've got the modifier stack properties. At the top, we can see these four buttons, apply all, delete all, viewport visibility and toggle stack. I think these are great. They do exactly what they say. We can toggle the stack, basically collapse the whole thing, open it up, toggle the viewport visibility for the modifier stack in one button. So it toggles all of them at once. We can delete all of them in one go, makes you confirm, and also apply all of them. It saves you from having to press control A or clicking down this arrow and then clicking apply for like all of them individually. So yeah, I just, I really like these buttons. I don't know why they're not there by default. But yeah, I use the modifier stack all the time. I didn't know about this one until recently. I'd have been thinking, well, why haven't I used this more often? Now this next inbuilt add-on is a bit of a beast. It's a very popular add-on, it can do a lot of stuff, and it's called Node Wrangler. Now traditionally I haven't really used Node Wrangler much because I like remembering exactly where all of my links are when I plug them in, but Node Wrangler is great if you're used to using nodes a lot of the time. And it basically speeds up the workflow for creating, swapping node links and previewing things, connecting things without having to move all the way back and forth between a node tree. So I've highlighted four of my favorite hotkeys from the add-on, there are so many more. If you go to Edit, Preferences, and then find the Node Wrangler add-on, and then you can show the hotkey list. And here you can see all of the hotkeys that are available to you. So you can really study this add-on and try and integrate it into your workflow if you like. But here are some of the things that I think I would get use out of if I actually invested the time into making it part of my muscle memory when using the shader nodes. Okay, so the obvious first one is Control, Shift and Left Mouse button to preview the node output. Now this is the most useful one, I think, because say you're using different shaders or you have different nodes you want to test, just press Control, Shift, Left Click on the different node group or output or anything you like and it's going to swap it to that. So you can see here, I've got the glossy BSDF for this battered metal. Again, sorry not to plug my own stuff too much, but these node groups are from my modular metals pack, just in case you were wondering. So back to the copper, back to the iron, back to the shader. So you just control shift and click on the node. You don't need to drag these links over manually. Hold up. These are some of the most complex node groups I've ever made. So how is Cycles calculating them so fast? Well, let me ask you something. Do you suffer from low viewport performance? Performance. Do you have trouble previewing your scene for all of that disgusting noise? Ew, so gross. Do you experience crashes that last more than four hours? Four hours. Then you may be suffering from GPU deficiency. Fast render speeds and a high viewport responsiveness are essential parts of a 3D artist's diet. Thanks to NVIDIA's RTX GPUs, powered by their RT Intensor cores, combined with recent Cycles X performance improvements, you too can experience exceptional render speeds. Here's a comparison of one of my previous art scenes, showing the frame calculation time between the CPU, CUDA, and Optics render devices. Realistically, only the hardware accelerated options will allow me to render a full animation before I completely lose my mind, which occasionally happens. The Tensor cores and NVIDIA GPUs are designed for speeding up calculations in deep learning and AI applications. An example of this in Blender is the implementation of the Optics render device and denoising features, which utilize the cores to let us quickly visualize our artwork by pumping out samples at a rapid pace and eliminating noise from the scene. Thanks to these innovations, the GPU is fantastic at doing the heavy lifting, allowing us as the artist to focus on creative tasks. And in certain situations, we can even achieve seemingly real-time performance in cycles, which I talked about more in a recent video. So there's a link below if you want to learn more. But for now, let's get back to the video. So that's great. Another thing is detaching outputs. So say you had a complex node tree, right? And this output was well far away and you thought, oh, I want to detach this thing here. I don't know how to do it. Oh, that's kind of annoying. Just have the shader selected, Alt-Shift-D and it's done. And again, control, shift and left click to plug it back in. So if you start remembering these hotkeys, it's going to really save you a lot of time of just like navigating through your own complex mess of nodes. Okay, so another cool one, alt, shift and right mouse button. So if you hold alt and shift and then hold the right click, you're going to bring up this little UI element here and it's going to let you drag and point towards another node. So the cool thing about this is if we do that, it's going to bring up a little menu here and it lets us select what we want to connect. So the BSDF to the surface and that would be the equivalent of doing that. So let's do that again. Alt, shift, right click, BSDF to surface. 
So it's a lazy way of connecting. I think this is quite handy if you're like zoomed out really far away. You know how sometimes it's really hard to grab like the different node points if you're really far out? But it's quite easy to see where the shader groups are. So pull shift right click, move over, BSTF to surface. So I quite like that. It's more of like a tactical strategic view of doing things. And then there's one more, which is the Alt S for swapping outputs. I think this should probably be called swap inputs, because if you do this, you see that it's moving the uh, input point around rather than the output ones. But if you have only one point in the node, it's going to just move it down and toggle it. But the interesting thing is that if you have two values here, and then you do Alt S, it's going to swap those around. So it's got different behaviors depending on what's available. But this works for any node. So we've got the material output here. Say we accidentally plug the mega shader into the wrong shader output, then we can use Alt S to swap that around. So there's lots to explore of Node Wrangler. A lot of people use it. So many hotkeys, so I recommend you give it a try. All right, now we have the extra objects add-on. Again, this one's really cool, but I forget about it far too often. There are actually two add-ons available. So there's the extra objects for the meshes and then the extra objects for the curves. And it does kind of what you would expect. If you press Shift A, then go to Mesh, you're going to see more options down here now. The single Vert is really useful. In fact, actually for the new version of Biogen that's coming, I've got a couple of operations in there. One of them is to make an object with a single Vert, because you might not realize how handy that actually is. But I love of the extra options that there are as well. Also look, round cube. So many times I'm making a cube and then applying a subsurf myself, it's already there. And a lot of these things have parameters as well. So say we make this torus, we have all the properties down here so we can control that. But what's more impressive than like these extra options for the meshes is that the curve ones are really impressive. So now that we've enabled the extra objects for the curves, there are so many more options down here, each with their own icons. Then maybe if we go down to knots and torus knot plus, I like this one because there are so many presets for this. So let's choose like braided coil. So we got this really complex braided coil, exactly what it says. But then we can change all these parameters to get some like really abstract coil shapes with it. We can change the radii as well, segment resolutions and everything. So you get some really, really interesting shapes going with these extra objects. All right, so I'm going to add a coil, give that material. Let's take a look at some of the extra meshes. They have a rock generator in here as well, which is interesting. So if you want to generate rocks, you can do that. You can have like different numbers of them. Let's only make one. Uh, don't use a random seed, so you can define your own seed for it. You can even increase the uh, the detail level, kind of, I think it's using displacement and subdiv. And it also generates a modifier stack for you. All right, let me change the deformation. I'm just playing around with more of these values. Make a new material for this. Maybe give this one a bit of a brighter color. I don't know, let's just say we're doing something kind of abstract because that's what everyone calls it. So ta-da, with a couple of objects, we made something that looks kind of mediocre, but I mean, it's fun. There's lots of different stuff you can play with here. But to be more professional, one of the reasons I love using the single vert object is because when I'm doing my hard surface modeling, I love using the skin modifier. So basically from this single object, you can just draw out more vertices. Then we can add the skin modifier scale it down and one of my recent blender tips videos actually talked about how useful the skin modifier can be you know we can go on like that so you can do a lot with single verts right from the get-go so i'm quite happy that that's in there all right the next add-on is 3d print toolbox now i don't really have a very pretty demonstration for this but what it has is the cleaning non-manifold operation so if you press f3 to open up the search bar you can start typing in whatever you like non-manifold manifold 3d print whatever it'll try and come up but you'll find the mesh print 3d clean non-manifold operation here and if you click that it's going to assess your object and then at the bottom here we can see that it's modified vertices. What it does is it looks for any floating geometry that might have been a mistake and removes that and then any duplicated geometry. So um, if you're doing like the remove doubles or merge by distance, it does that as well. I think it does something with the normals as well. It basically prepares the object for 3D printing. So making sure it's manifold, essentially meaning that the object has a definite and easy to discover internal volume, which is quite important when translating it into like the physical space. But the other thing that's useful about this is the same operation can be used to help prepare an object for rigging using automatic weights. So sometimes you might sculpt a character and then try to do the automatic rigging for an armature. And then you'll get an error pop up that says, hey, you know, we haven't been able to resolve these different bones. Sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes using this 3D print clean non-manifold operation can fix that problem. So that's why I think it's a really useful tool. So one more add-on I'm going to show you here is one that I think is actually quite fun. It's not as serious or professional as the other ones, but I think it actually looks pretty good. And it's the real snow add-on. What this does is it adds a panel in your 3D view here, real snow. And then if you have an object selected, multiple if you like, you can choose the coverage and the height, and then you can press add snow. And then it just adds snow to your objects. And also if we go into the rendered view and we zoom in, we'll notice that it's got a proper material. Not only that, but it also has displacement, like micro polygon displacement. So if you check the modifier stack, you'll see that if you're using cycles, it'll have the adaptive subdivision enabled on the modifier. So you can actually get some really high quality snow effects going with this. Now my lights are a bit bright in this scene, so I should probably just dim those down a bit. 
So here we can see the snow a bit better. It's actually got quite a nice material to it as well with a bit of subsurface scattering. But you can click on it and have a look at the material yourself as well and see how they made it. It's all nicely laid out in there. But like I said, this is freely available so you can play around with it. And I think it's quite fast to actually generate the snow over an object. I mean, look at this, it's quite funny. He's got like a new hairstyle going here and a little bit on the nose, boop, boop. But yeah, it's just a fun one to play with. And you can do it with any shape as well. So you make it a plane, just bring that out, press add snow. Obviously, the plane's quite a big one here to be adding snow to. So realistically, I'd only make some smaller objects, add snow to it, and then maybe instance those if you wanted to get like a large coverage. But theoretically, as you can see here, this is quite dangerous to do because it is a lot of polygonal mess. You can technically do it like this. Although I would not try to render all of that with the adaptive subdivision enabled. So here we go, a snowy scene, very Christmassy, right in time for the holidays. Anyway, hopefully you found these interesting and maybe you can give some of these add-ons a try. Like I said, they're all pre-packaged with Blender. You don't need to download them or buy anything. Just go into your edit, preferences, and then enable whatever you like. And there's many other ones to discover as well. So before we close this up, remember this video is sponsored by NVIDIA and PC Specialist. They are working together under an initiative called NVIDIA Studio, which is where NVIDIA works with other companies to design products for creative professionals. If you take a look at the link in the description, you'll see a page on the PC Specialist website which outlines how NVIDIA Studio can help you with your creative workflows, especially in regards to GPU acceleration for different applications you might use to make your content. And even in Premiere as well, which I use to edit my videos, there's hardware acceleration enabled in that as well to help building the previews for different video files. If you want to get your hands on a machine that's guaranteed to make good use of the NVIDIA GPUs, then in the link below on that web page, you'll find a list of NVIDIA's recommended specs, and through there you'll be able to design your own computer, which PC Specialist will then build and send to you. There's a lot of fun to play with. They also sent me a computer here, which I've called the Render Beast, and this is a representation of what you can get from the website. So thank you very much to NVIDIA and PC Specialist for sponsoring this video. I hope you've enjoyed it, and feel free to let me know if there's any other in-built add-ons with Blender that you think are essential for people to use, because I'll be interested in trying it out myself as well. So thanks for watching everyone, stay safe, and I will see you next time.